This video will cover the higher level section of cell structure and it's all about the origin and evolution of cells. We have a lot of evidence to suggest prokaryotes were the first cells to form, followed by eukaryotes much later, and there's a lot of supporting evidence that we'll talk about for this theory called endosymbiosis. So if we break down this word, endo meaning inside, and symbiosis, they're working together somehow, right? So some kind of like relationship between these two things. And this is all about the formation of those compartmentalized eukaryotic cells that resulted from engulfing prokaryotic cells. And we're going to focus in on two organelles, the mitochondria and chloroplasts. So the endosymbiosis theory starts like this. We have early eukaryotes and then prokaryotes, some of which are heterotrophic. That means that they are consuming things for their nutrition and autotrophic prokaryotes. So they are manufacturing their own um, carbon compounds. And these early eukaryotes are going to engulf them. So that process would look something like this, um, each of these being engulfed okay, by that early eukaryote, and then they wind up on the inside of the cell. And these are what then evolved into the mitochondria that we know today, and of course, the chloroplast. And so what we really want to think about is what is the evidence that this is the mechanism by which this happened? And before we can touch on that evidence, what I want you to pay careful attention to is the fact that the mitochondria and the chloroplast were once prokaryotes. And so we want to be looking for similarities between the mitochondria and, chl and chloroplast and the prokaryotes that they evolved from. And those similarities look like this. So mitochondria and chloroplasts both have their own circular DNA, just like prokaryotes. Inside of a mitochondria and a chloroplast, we're going to find 70S ribosomes, just like prokaryotes, much different than the eukaryote 80S ribosomes that I would find in the rest of the cell. They synthesize their own proteins and they reproduce independently of the cell. So mitochondria and chloroplasts do their own thing to make them new mitochondria and chloroplasts. It's independent of the rest of the cell. And they use a process called binary fission, which you guessed it, is the same process that prokaryotes use. So these are all the ways in which the mitochondria and chloroplasts are very similar to the prokaryotes that they came from. So it's important when you're talking about evidence that we want to link them together. The other thing that's really interesting here is that mitochondria and chloroplasts both have a double membrane. One membrane from the original prokaryote that they came from and another membrane from that engulfing process. So lots of evidence here to support this endosymbiotic theory. Now the endosymbiotic theory explains how one cell uh, became specialized and compartmentalized. That cell differentiation is a little bit of a different process. So this is all about what happens in multicellular organisms that allows them to have different types of cells. So multicellularity, being multicellular many cells, involves what we call cell specialization. So that's the process by which cells develop different structures and functions. And it happens during embryonic development. So when we are an embryo, all of our little stem cells here are undifferentiated. They're all identical and they all have identical genes. So the way that we get such a variety in different cell types is during embryonic development, some of those genes are expressed and some of those genes are not. You may have heard it referred to as some of those genes are turned on and some of them are turned off. So for example, this neuron is going to turn on all of the genes that tell it how to do neuron things and cardiac cells are not going to have those same genes turned on. They're going to express the genes that help them to look like and function as cardiac cells. Now, there are some genes that are expressed in every cell. So genes like how to manufacture ribosomes or how to go through cell division, 
those are going to be in common with every cell. So again, I'm thinking about this theme of unity and diversity. So unity here, diversity in terms of which genes are expressed and which aren't. And that's how we get different cell types in multicellular organisms. So in thinking about the pathway of how living things evolved, we started with prokaryotes and then we got eukaryotes and all of those were unicellular and eventually multicellularity evolved. And now we see multicellularity in all animals. So that's one of the parts of the definition of an animal. We are all multicellular. All plants are multicellular, and then some fungi and some algae are multicellular. Not all of them, but some of them. And what makes multicellular organisms unique is that they have specialized cells, but one of the maybe downfalls about these specialized cells is that they're doing specialized jobs. And because they're doing specialized jobs, that means if I take them out of the organism, they won't be able to survive on their own because within the organism, they rely on the other cell types to do the other functions of living things. The only way to explain why multicellularity is found in so many organisms is that there must be an advantage there. So most multicellular organisms have much longer lifespans and they grow to different sizes so they can exploit different niches or different roles in ecosystems and they can differentiate into multiple cell types. So that means that together they can um, live a much more efficient life, right? So they can accomplish tasks at a much greater efficiency because they have specialists cells. However, in terms of number, there are far more unicellular organisms on Earth than multicellular ones. So unicellularity must also have some advantages. And there will be some times where being multicellular isn't an advantage. So again, a great way of demonstrating both unity and then here in diversity.